Welcome. This is going to be a quick code overview video of an open source project that I have been messing around with the last week or so and thought I'd share. So here's the project right here. And you can see, let me switch, make sure I can navigate. You can see we can navigate this 3D dungeon. And it looks all pixelated and Kind of cool. I like the look that it has. So if you want to test this project yourself, you can navigate to the GitHub repo. I'll have a link in the description and in the comments for that. I've put this under the MIT license, so you can do whatever you want with it as long as you include that license and, you know, you can make it into a full game and sell it, whatever. So I'm just going to talk about the code and kind of walk through the way that I've structured this project to help people get a better understanding of what's in it. The project is composed of four main scenes. We have the world scene, which handles the generation of the map. We have the map scene, which is the map layout. We have the player scene, which controls the player. And we have the cell scene. This is what the world is created from. Let's start by taking a look at the relationship between the map scene and the world scene. The map scene is just a map and you can see it has this little teeny bit of code here that just gets the tile map. So we have this little bit of code that gets whatever map is assigned to this node. So if you want to make a map, you would make it inherit from this node and then you would manipulate the tiles on this map. So you can see we can easily create the map for the level just by manipulating this tile set. And this bit of code here, the get tile map function, is used inside of the world script. So let's come into our world. And our world script, it needs to load the cell. And we'll talk more about exactly how the cell works later. And then it needs to generate a map. And I do some stuff with the environment to kind of make it look cool. Messing around with the ambient light, the, the depth of field and stuff. But all it really needs to do is generate the map here. So we check to make sure we got a map. And we're getting it through a pack scene. So you can um, drag any map you want to into the world right here and it will load whatever map you drag into here. So we're getting we're making sure that it's a that the map is a pack scene and then we instance that map and then we get the tile map from it. And then from the tile map we get the used cells. So this function is a function in the tile map node and it just returns an array of vectors. And the vector is just the position of each tile map, or the position of each tile in the tile map. So we're just getting a list of positions. So it's going to take all of these nodes right here, all of these tiles, I should say, and gives us a list of those. From there, we're going to loop through that list, and we're going to create a cell and position it at each position in that tile map. And the grid size is based on however big the cell is. And it's, it's just, I've got it set up as a global right now, and it's just two. It's a global constant a value of two. So that's how big the cells are, they're two. So then we, we set their translation, their position in 3D space to be zero, and then the position of whatever the tile is, okay? Now, before we get into this little bit of code right here where we update the cell faces, let's actually take a look at how the cell is constructed. So you can see the cell is just a room. It's got four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. And all of these walls and uh, floors and ceilings are constructed of faces that I've applied a texture to. And I applied this texture using Blender. So let's come into Blender real quick here. And you can see all I did was I made a face. Uh, so I just, I had the 
default cube in Blender and I deleted all the faces except for the bottom one. And then I applied a texture to it through UV mapping. And you can see if we select this face here, you can see that I've stretched it out so that it should, this texture is repeatable, so it'll repeat four times on here, and that's just how I wanted to do it. It was easiest to set it up this way, but I needed to make sure that I mapped it in Blender specifically because trying to do it in Godot um, wasn't working very well. Blender is the better tool for that anyways. Okay, so each of these faces inside of the cell, we get access to them, right? And then the update faces, what it does, this function that we call here, um, we pass in the use tiles. So we pass in that array. And then we just check to see if there's a tile to the right or up or down or to the left of it. And then if there is a tile there, then we hide that face. So essentially, if we have this face right here, and there's another, or this cell right here, and there's another cell over here, then we would take, uh, I can't click that face, this face right here, and we would hide it so that it wouldn't be there. And as the player was in this cell right here, if there was a cell over here, then they could move over there because this face wouldn't be visible. The last trick with the cell is that it is actually an area 3D and I've got a collision shape, just this box you can see right in the middle of the cell. And this is how I control the player's movement. The player has ray casts coming out of it and it will detect to see if, it, if the player can detect, if those ray casts can detect a cell, then it will allow the player to move into that cell. So. That's how I've set up the movement for the player, and we'll go take a look at that at right now. Take a look at that right now. Here we are inside the player scene. You can see I've got four ray casts, forward, back, right, and left. These are the ray casts that will detect the area, the cell area, to see if the player can move in that direction. I've got a spotlight going forward, and I've also got an... Uh, I forget what kind of light this is called. I guess it's an omni light. And I've also got an omni light on the player. So it kind of has this candle like light that is the main light. And then I also added a very slight spotlight to kind of focus that as well. And we have a tween node because I use this for the movement and a camera that is attached to the player. And I moved it slightly back. It's not right on the player's position. And that just helps the view. Uh, it makes the view make a little more sense when you're navigating in the dungeon. Inside of the code, I get access to the different raycasts and the tween. And then this is how I handled the movement. This is not the best way to handle the movement. Okay, I just check to see if they press forward. And then I do a collision check, which just checks in a direction. And I just pass in, I just pass in the, the raycast. It just checks in a direction. So if that ray cast is colliding, then it returns true. So it says, yeah, there's a cell there. You can move in that direction. Then I set the physics process to false. So I basically turn off physics processing. And then I tween the player's position and move forward. And I use a get direction function that I've written here, which just gets the difference between it gets the difference between our position and the position of the cell that we're trying to move to. And so it gets the difference between those. And when we call tween translation, we pass in that difference. And you can see we just translate from our current position to our current position plus that difference. That's pretty easy. And then we just start the tween and we, we yield until that tween is complete. And then once the tween is complete, then we set physics process to true again. And I don't necessarily like setting physics process on and off like this all the time, but it does work for here. If you want to improve on this code, you can, because you can just download the Git repository and fix it. And then I have rotation here, which just tweens the rotation. And I just do it by pi divided by two, which is 90 degrees. And 
And you can see it's the same here. We turn off the physics process, tween the rotation, and turn it back on. And that's it. I mean, I did do some changes to the global environment, or the default environment, I should say. If you come in here and you see, I did, I did actually enable depth of field manually, but I did add some ambient occlusion. It kind of helps with the edges of the room here. You can see the corners are darker. That's what the ambient occlusion does. And I did a lot of ambient occlusion. This is over-exaggerated. It's, I would say, uh, because you're in a dungeon, I wanted it to look kind of dark and grimy. So very over-exaggerated, but that's, I did set up the ambient occlusion there. And then I guess the other setup would be on the faces. For the faces I did in their material, I did set up, I set the diffuse mode. Um, this seemed to give better results, this Lambert. So, and then I disabled specular mode. Uh, I gave it the texture. I guess we're on the bottom. Let's do the, let's do the bricks here. So for the albedo, I gave it the texture. And then for the normal map, I drew a normal map inside of a sprite and what i did was i just googled normal map colors and then it gives you references you can use and then i just copied the grid here and drew over that grid and kept it very simple you can see this is a really simple normal map but the effect works quite well if you look at it here in blender we go to object mode and select our light here uh, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good in Blender. About as good as you can get with a simple normal map on a brick texture like this. So I just applied that texture. One thing that I did have to do, which I thought was interesting, is I had to set the color mode for the normal map to linear. So if we click on the cube, in here you can see the normals, I set it to linear, the color space to linear, and that seemed to give better results. Uh, any other color space seemed to mess up the normals, and they didn't work quite correctly. And that's it. It's a pretty simple project. You can see that as I update this, as I update this map right here and run the game, uh, it accurately updates the dungeon itself and connects those hallways and we can then navigate them. So pretty cool. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed this video and you found it helpful. Go download the source code for this. I'm also doing a Black Friday sale on my Godot course, the one bit Godot course. So if you've been thinking about buying that, now's a good time to do it. It's discounted by quite a bit and I also recently updated it to add some updates to the lectures for Godot 3.4, which is a great update, really liking the 3.4 update. So check that out. And I'll have some updates on my channel, likely here soon. I know some of you might be wondering, where's Ben? What's happening to him? Uh, my wife and I recently had a baby, so I've kind of been taking a break from YouTube and trying to figure out exactly what I want to do with my channel. So expect an update about that here soon. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you all later.